I think part of our job is to make sure that we're giving people the right view of what we do. That's, of course, something which we're going to learn more about over the next two days. Of course, I'm standing here. I'm a sort of a cod hack in this field of perception, seeing, and understanding. Uh, I know much less about it than, fortunately, our keynote speaker knows a great deal about it. Um, he's a professor at UCL, University College London, in the field of neuroscience, and particularly interested in how neuroscience applies to learning. But far from being merely an academic in an ivory tower, he also has a couple of businesses. One is a Silicon Valley tech startup. And the other one is a beautiful mind, focused on this business of neuroscience for learning. Perfect for us, because increasingly, we have to know, to do our jobs well, about how the brain works, how it learns, and how we can use that to our advantage, to do our job as well as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our keynote for day two, Bo Lotto. Thank you for having me. So I have an aim. It's the aim I have in every single talk. And what I want you to do is know less at the end than you think you know now, all right? And I always succeed, <laughs> right? No matter how well I do, I always achieve the same. So why do I want you to do this? Because anything interesting begins with doubt. And I want you to walk out of here doubting. Doubting what you think you know, even what you think you see, all right? And I've got about 45 minutes to do that. And one thing in particular I want you to doubt is I want you to doubt what you think you understand about learning, okay? So what is at the heart of learning? Now I'm gonna approach this from sort of the neuroscientific, the behavioral point of view. And could I have the volume down a little bit? I don't like hearing my own voice. So what is at the heart of learning? It's perception, okay? It's seeing differently. That's what learning is really about, is you're trying to get people to see differently than the way they've been seeing before. So we actually are trying to create perceptions when we're teaching, when people are learning. We're creating perceptions. So perception is at the heart of learning. In fact, perception is at the heart of everything we do. Everything we think, we know, we believe, our hopes, our dreams, the clothes we wear, the people we fall in love with, everything begins with perception. Okay? Learning fundamentally, possibly most fundamentally. So how does your brain see? If we're going to try to get people to see differently, we have to understand how the brain literally makes sense. How do we see? Well, we're going to talk about color. And the reason we're going to talk about color is color is the simplest thing that the brain does, all right? Seeing lightness, it doesn't get any easier than seeing lightness. Even a jellyfish sees lightness, and they don't even have a brain, all right? So we're going to focus on seeing light. So what is color for? Rather than tell you, I want to show you. So how many of you can see the predator that's about to jump out at you, all right? And if you haven't seen it yet, you're dead, right? <laughs> especially here, <laughs> right? Now, over 90% of the information your brain uses to see comes from lightness. It's there, literally there for you to see. No one can find it? How many think they can find it? Oh, interesting. Okay, where do you think it is? Give me a quadrant. It's in the middle there. It's your right brother. Ah, so you think it's here? Yeah. Okay, you're dead. <laughs> Okay? A bear's head. A bear's head, right up in the up, upper left. Ah, yes. oh, brilliant. You're dead too. Okay? <laughs> yeah? Upper right. Upper right. Okay, you're, you're dead. Oh my God. Okay. Ah, let's see. It's the exact same image, just with the color. All right? For those who maybe shouldn't be here, there it is. Okay? Right? So that's what color enables us to do. It enables us to see more information than we would with black and white, but it's actually only adding a very small amount. Now, if I go back, you can, of course, see it. Right? It was always there. <coughs> so that's what color's for. What you've actually done is mathematically impossible. Computers can't do what you've just done. Playing chess is easy. Recognizing objects under different locations, different environments, different orientations, that's what's hard. 
And we're going to talk about why that is so hard and why we do it so easily. So how many of you think that you're seeing reality? <laughs> how many of you would like to think that you see reality? You think you, oh, do you see reality? Well, I don't know. What I see, I think it's reality, but it might not be for you. Might not be. How many, how many, when you open your eyes, you think, I mean, do you see me? Do you see a stage? Do you see light? I mean, are you not seeing the world as it really is? Why would you see it otherwise? How could we all see it differently and still survive? So how many people think you see the world as it is? How many don't know? How many don't care? Right? Well, let's do a test, all right? Very simple. We have four circles going from left to right. Are they getting bigger? Yeah. The one on the left is literally smaller than the ones on the right. And you see it is getting bigger. So at least in terms of size, you're seeing the world as it is, it seems. Right? Yeah. OK, here we have two identical squares. They're identical in every way, physically the same. The one on the left is emitting just as much light as the one on the right. And they look the same. Agreed? So again, it's as if we're seeing the world as it really is. Right? When things are different, they should look different. When things are the same, they should look the same. But we have a problem. What if we just change the context of the information? What if we just change what surrounds it? Now, we're not going to change those squares at all. We're just going to change what surrounds it. And now, do they look the same? The one on the left, to me, looks lighter than the one on the right. We're talking about the little squares. Yeah? Now, those squares are physically the same but they look different. This is called simultaneous brightness contrast. Again, we're talking about lightness. Jellyfish, no brain, would also see this, right? So even at this level, context is everything, right? Even seeing lightness. So that context is everything we kind of already know. Artists have been exploring this for hundreds of years. A far more interesting question is why is context everything? And to understand that question is not only just to understand discovery and learning, it's actually to understand what it is to be human. And this is the topic that I work on. So why is context everything? The reason is we have no direct access to our physical world. If you think about Berkeley, Berkeley says we cannot interact with our physical world other than through our senses. Right? That's all I get. The problem with that information that our brain gets is that it conflates multiple things about the world. So imagine your eye is here. This is the stimulus. And your eye is receiving information from the world, right? That information is determined in terms of color, is determined by three different things. The color of the illumination, the color of the objects, the color of the space between you and objects. You vary any one of those things, and you'll change the stimulus. You have a white surface under yellow light. The stimulus will be different than the same white surface under blue light. Right? But your brain can't directly interact with the light or the surface. So how does it know why it's changing? One, let's just make this point one more time. Imagine this is the back of your eye, and you have two projections from the real world that are exactly the same in every way. Right? So they're exact same shape, size, spectral quality. Everything about them is the same. Right? As far as your eye is concerned, they are the same. Now, this is the only access your brain has to the real world is through your eyes. So as far as your brain is concerned, they should also be the same. Agreed? Right. Problem is, they're created by completely different sources in the world. This one and that one. The one on the left comes from an orange object oriented this way, viewed through some blue medium. Under direct light, the one on the right comes from a yellow object oriented exactly the opposite direction in shadow, viewed through a pink medium completely different conditions in the world, giving rise to the exact same information that's falling onto your eyes. This is why your eyes actually have very little to do with seeing. Only 10% of the information your eyes, uh, only 10% of the information your brain uses to see comes from your eyes. Your eyes are like a keyboard to a computer. When I speak to an ophthalmology audience, they're not so keen about that point. 90% comes from the other parts of your brain. Right? 
So how does your brain see? So if you remember anything, remember this. Information is meaningless. All information is meaningless. It's inherently meaningless. Information doesn't tell you what to do. Data is pointless in of itself. All right? Even at the level of the senses of your, that, that are going into your brain, even the sense of light, sound, touch, all information is meaningless because it could literally mean anything. By meaning, I mean it could actually mean anything in terms of your behavior. What did this signify? What am I supposed to do with this? So how does your brain make meaning? The information I get is meaningless. So how do I make meaning? It does two things. First, your brain evolved to discover pattern. Okay? Pattern is a more efficient way of describing information. It's about finding relationships. Your brain is really good at finding relationships. But those relationships themselves don't tell you what to do. They are themselves ambiguous. There's an infinite number of possible relationships that I could use. So your brain then associates those relationships, that pattern, with a meaning. By meaning, it's what, what this meant for my behavior in the past. Right? It's literally that meaning that you see, which means you never see pattern, you never see information, you never see data, you only ever see meaning that's grounded in your history. Okay, so I'm going to do an example to show you how quickly your brain can what I call redefine normality. Okay, and I'll need the lights down for this, please. So you're going to come to see the world. We're going to do a magic trick, okay, but it's going to happen in your head, right? And I want you to stare at this dot between the green and the, or green and the red. <coughs> and first, actually, notice these two desert scenes. Notice they're the same color, yes? One is just a flipping of the other. Yeah? Okay. Now stare at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. We're going to do this for about 30 seconds. And your brain is learning. You're literally learning that the left side of your visual field is under red light, and the right side of your visual field is under red light. Did I say that right? Yeah. That's what you're learning right now. Do not look anywhere else. You're redefining normality, which means what you see later will be shaped by what you're doing now. And again, we're just talking about color. So keep looking. You're also getting very sleepy. <laughs> keep looking, keep looking. OK, I'm going to count you down. When I tell you to, I want you to look at the dot between the desert scenes. Not yet, but when I tell you to. Five, four, three, two, one. Look there. Do they look the same? No. For 7% of the male population in this room, they will, because you're color deficient. OK? You're not color blind. Very few people are actually color blind. It means you confuse red and green. Some of you actually confuse blue and yellow. But most of you will see them as being different. Now as you look at it, they'll start going back to the other way, right? Because your brain is now redefining normality again. That's how we make sense of the world, is by interacting with the world. Literally by how we move our eyes is interaction. Okay. Why does this happen? Because your brain evolved to adapt. We're constantly adapting. We're constantly learning. How? We're literally reshaping the connections in our brain. So here's a dish of brain cells growing. These are called growth cones. Those are a neurite. That's a brain cell. And it's looking for other neurons, other neurites. That's what forms your network inside of your brain. How your brain cells grow is shaped by what you do, literally. If I take two rats and I raise one in a deprived environment, very few toys, very little interaction, and the other rats I raise in a rich environment, their brain cells look completely different. The one on the left is a rat raised in a deprived environment. Well, it's not a rat, it's a brain cell from the rat, right? The one on the right, go back is from the brains of a rat raised in an enriched environment. You can see many more connections, many more branches, and then on the branches you have these boutons, which is where the cells connect, right? What's interesting, the person who originally did the study was my supervisor at Berkeley. 
And what many people don't report is that if you raise rats in an over-enriched environment, they look like rats in a deprived environment. So you can do too much, right? So that's what your brain does. That's how your brain is always seeing differently, right? So what do we see? We never see pattern. We never see what's there. All we ever see is what proved useful to see in the past. That's all we ever see. We see a meaning grounded in history. History of our individual selves, but also of our social selves, as well as our evolutionary history. That's what we see. Okay? So we see meaning. Right? So we're going to play a game to show you what I mean. And in this game, I want you to read what you see. And we're going to do it all together. Okay? So one, two, three. Very good. One, two, three. Very good. One, two, three. The Portuguese in the room, right? One, two, three. Now, remember the assignment class. I said, read what you see. That says, what are you reading? Right? That's what that literally says. One of you, I think, was doing that. And then, whoa, everyone else is reading it differently, so you shifted. You literally started seeing things differently because of what was around you, which is a very important point we'll come to later, right? That literally says, what are we in? Why did you put an H there? Because historically, it would have been useful to do so. So you do so again, right? There's no a priori reason why an H has to go there. There's no law of physics that tells you to do it. You don't put a letter on the other side of T. Why? Because it wasn't useful. Your brain has literally encoded the statistics of co-occurring letters in the English language and, in some cases, Portuguese, right? Or Turkish, right? Or not. Or different statistics than most. So that's what your brain is doing, right? So even at the level of brightness, notice that none of you read What Are You Dreaming? It's just as likely. Why? Because I had you reading. So you read What Are You Reading? Right? Very gullible. OK? So what does this mean for color and lightness? Notice, we have, again, we have this illusion. What you're seeing here is the meaning of those squares. You're not seeing the physicality of squares. You're seeing their meaning. What do I mean by that? Here we have the exact same illusion repeated. Two tiles, one in a dark and light surround. Two tiles, one in a light and dark surround. I have the lights down a bit. I'm going to reveal the rest of the scenes, but I'm not going to change anything inside those squares. OK? Have the lights a little bit. OK? Notice what happens to your perception. The ones on the left, this one looks nearly white, that one nearly black. But notice these two squares look nearly the same. And yet this is still in a dark surround, and that's still in a light surround. What's different is their meaning. If that were actually in shadow, there would be less light hitting it. If there's less light hitting it, but it's reflecting the same amount of light to your eye as the one in light, it must be more reflective. It would have proved to be so in the past. So you see it as being lighter. Whereas all the information here is consistent with the, same, the two surfaces being under the same light. If they're under the same light, reflecting the same amount of light to your eye, they must be equally reflective. So you see them as being equally light. right? But there is no table there. There is no shadow. There are no tiles but your brain can't help but see it that way. You're seeing the meaning of the information, right? Which means we can create very strong perceptions where this brown, this orange tile, not brown tile, look very different. Agreed? OK, that's your perceptual reality. But that's the physical reality. They're, in fact, identical. Perceptual reality and physical reality. We have four gray tiles on the left. Seven gray tiles on the right, they're all the same. What if I change their meaning? I want you to keep your eye on that one there and see what happens to your perception. Everyone see four blue tiles on the left and seven yellow tiles on the right? Yeah, roughly? They're all the same. They're all gray. All the blue tiles and all the yellow tiles are unchanged. They're only changing in meaning, and therefore they're changing in how you see them. These two surfaces are the same. 
the surface at the top is exactly the same as the surface underneath. Right? If I reveal them by the mask, there's a cut out there. Right? You can see that they're actually the same. The information here is the gradient between them. You all see four angles of different sizes. We have a big one, we have a small one. Agreed? All those angles are, in fact, 90 degree angles. Okay? So what's true for lightness and color and shape is even true for motion. So notice you probably all see this spinning from left to right. Yes? Keep looking at it. Blur your eyes, look around, and at some point it's going to go in the opposite direction. Okay? Blink, look around, blur. Think about it differently. How many people can get it to flip? Okay? Yeah? And every time you blink, it'll go the opposite direction. Yeah? What you're doing is your brain is imagining either looking down onto that central surface or looking up at that central surface. You're literally changing the way you think about it, and you're flipping its direction of motion. So, question. Which direction is it rotating? <laughs> How many people say left to right? How many people say right to left? How many people say, I don't care? <laughs> <coughs> what if I were to tell you there is no motion on this screen? It's not moving at all. There's literally no movement. Right? You're looking at an animation. An animation is just a series of still images. Your brain is taking a sequence of still images that are all slightly different from each other and turning it into motion. It's called apparent motion. It's taking that apparent motion and then flipping it back and forth. Right? So we're seeing something that doesn't move, moving, and then flipping its direction of motion, depending on how you think about it. So I want to show you how you even construct your own perceptions. So I want you to listen to a piece of music, well, a piece of sound, rather, and I want you to see if you can hear any words in this sound, OK? OK, we'll play it again. Did anyone hear any words? Put your hands up if you think you heard some words. OK. All right, a few maybe. Listen to it again. Did you think you heard a word? Yeah. What was the word? <laughs> call. 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 OK. Mm -hmm. How many people heard the word call? Somewhere in there. One. OK, I want you to listen to it again. And I want you to try to hear the word call. OK, see if you can pick up on that word call. OK, how many people heard the call, word call now? Yeah? Quite a few people more. One more, should we do it one more time? See if you can hear it for those. OK, we'll do it one more time. How many people hear the word call now? Brilliant. Even more. OK, just to tell you, call doesn't exist, <laughs> right? But you literally hear it. Why do you literally hear it? Because someone else said, I hear the word call. Our perceptions are completely, fundamentally shaped by what's around us, right? By the people around us. That's culture, right? I want to suggest something else. I want to suggest a different sentence, OK? It's fun to smoke marijuana, right? And I want you to read along and listen to the music. How many people heard it then? Right, indication of the audience. So, that sentence doesn't exist. You're hearing something that doesn't exist. And what's more is you're getting better at hearing it. <laughs> right? That's learning. That's seeing differently. Now, what's really interesting is when we do this in a study, people who have heard another word before and really trained themselves to do that can't hear this anymore. 
I literally can't hear the word call. So some of you who might be heard call won't be able to hear this anymore. For the others, it's very obvious. Whenever I listen to this piece of music, I can't hear anything else. Right? So not only have you trained yourself to be better at hearing something that doesn't exist, you can't actually shift away from that. Right? Of course, this is the song. Right? So, point. You are your assumptions. Literally. Even at the level of seeing lightness is your assumptions. You're seeing a meaning that's grounded in your assumptions. So, some of you say, no, I have more free will than that. Surely, I'm not grounded in my assumptions. So we're going to do a little test. We're going to give you two shapes. Two shapes you've never seen before. Agreed? Yeah, you've not seen these shapes. Fairly abstract shapes. They don't have names. They're not triangle shapes or squares. Agreed? Okay. I'm going to give you two sounds, two words. One's kiki, right? Another's boo-boo. Now, you've never heard these either, right? Now, you kind of know what I'm going to say. Which of these shapes that you've never seen is kiki, and which of these shapes is boo-boo, right? Now, be independent. Practice your free will, right? And which of these shapes is Kiki and which is Boo Boo? How many people say Kiki's on the left? Yeah. And how many people say Boo Boo's on the right? How many people want to say the opposite? Right? <laughs> so I love that. So, what's the assumption that your brain is using? Your brain is using the assumption of pain. Right? So if you look at these objects here, we have nine objects. You probably all organize them in terms of rows. Yes? The top three look more similar, the middle three look more similar, the bottom three look more similar. Yes? For some, many, right? Not all. In fact, mathematically, it's the opposite direction. It's because your brain has an overrepresentation of sharpness and roundness. Why? Because of pain and pressure. You're seeing the meaning of the information. This is the basis of metaphor in the case of making relation of Kiki and Boo Boo to the shape. Okay? So if I give you two shapes now, and I give you a word love, and I give you another word hate, and I ask you which one is love and which one is hate, ooh, I've got it the other way around. Okay? <laughs> because hate is painful. People will see hate is sharp. Ignore those. Okay? Does everyone agree? It actually activates the same part of your brain when I give you the word hate as if I give you a pinprick. Right? Now, if I give you the word odio, how many say that's rounded and how many say that's sharp? Rounded? Yeah. How many say sharp? Now, if you're a Spanish-speaking audience, you'd say the opposite. Odio means hate. Even though it sounds round, it actually means hate. They hear it the other way around. Okay? Which means when it comes to perception, we're just like this frog. And I don't mean metaphorically. I mean literally like this frog. Okay? It's getting information. It's generating a behavior that's useful. <laughs> Just like us. The world is an iPhone. <laughs> I love that. That's such a good one. And when things don't quite go our way, we get a bit annoyed, right? <laughs> Just like that frog, right? So how could we ever see differently? If what we see is grounded in our history, how can we see differently than the way we're seeing right now? How could we ever learn? How could we ever teach anyone to see differently? Seems impossible. So how can we learn? Well, any new perception, all new perceptions begin in exactly the same way. Okay? And they begin with a question. Everything literally new begins with a question. I could go into the neuroscience of that for what questions do. I'll not do that here. But I'm going to tell you the two basic challenges, two fundamental challenges to learning, i.e. asking questions. Okay? The first one is that you're blind to your assumptions. If you're going to ask a question, 
you have to question your assumptions. But I have to know what my assumptions are. But my assumptions are blind to me, usually. Especially the ones we were born with. Especially the ones we were told, right? Rather than the ones we discover. So here's an example of someone who is incredibly blind to his assumptions. He's robbing a bank, OK? He walks in, gives him a note. Screens go up. Everything's locked down. He runs out. He can't get out, right? He's trapped. It seems they've locked him in. What's the assumption that he's not questioning? That the door opens <laughs> that way? <laughs> right? Completely blind to his assumption that doors push, right? That's also, by the way, what happens when we get stressed, is we go to what's familiar, we stop searching, we focus on one solution, right? Because this leads on to the second most important problem. Well, actually, before I do that, I'm gonna give, we're going to do a test. Okay? Here's a string of letters. I want to show you how, you're, how you even look around the world is grounded by, shaped by your assumptions. So I want you to shout out some three-letter words. Okay? Just give me some three-letter words. Sex. Run. Run. What was one? Sex. Sex. Brilliant. Sorry? Body. Body. Three letters? Okay. Sex, another sex, right? Okay. How some three letter words here? Brilliant. Now, notice how the words you're giving me in this letter string are different from the words you gave me in the last letter string. They're all the same letters. All the letters in this one are in this one, they're just in a different order, right? So, what's your brain doing? What's the assumption? Your brain assumes that letters that are next to each other belong to each other. What's more, you're biased to look at it from left to right. right. Your assumptions are actually shaping the information that you get, the meaning that you're getting from this letter string. So the second fundamental problem about assumptions, which is also evident in that video of stress, is that all questions create uncertainty. And we hate uncertainty. We evolve to hate uncertainty. If you're not sure that's a predator, it's too late. OK? We hate uncertainty. When you go down below on a boat, and the boat's moving, and your inner ears are saying, well, I'm moving. But your eyes are saying, because they're moving in register with the boat, no, I'm standing still. Your brain can't deal with that. It literally gets ill. Because it can't deal with that uncertainty. We hate it. Right? We evolve to make what is uncertain certain. That's what we're constantly doing. You were finding meaning in a random series of sounds. That's how strongly you have to find certainty. So how do we deal with uncertainty? I should also say the best questions are the ones that create the most uncertainty. The questions that challenge what we assume to be true already. Those are the ones that create the most uncertainty, because those are the ones that questions who we are. Right? Fortunately, evolution gave us a solution. So who can tell me what is the only human endeavor where uncertainty is a good thing? What's the only thing that we do, in general, where uncertainty is celebrated? Die? Die? <laughs> Ooh. Well, we don't really care anymore, I suppose. I suppose that's true. I'm not sure if we celebrate uncertainty in that case. We just are indifferent to it. OK? Yeah? So not knowing the sex of your child. Not knowing the sex of your child? OK, so that's a type of uncertainty that we would celebrate for some, not all. Yeah? Religion, choosing a partner. Religion, choosing a partner. OK, possibly. What? Family. Family, family uncertainty. Being born. Being born. Mm, yeah, so death and, right? <laughs> death and birth. OK, let's narrow those down a little bit. What is an activity, a behavior that we actually do? Play. Sorry? Play. Play is the only human endeavor where uncertainty is a good thing, literally, 
To not know the punchline of a joke is what makes it funny. To not know who's going to win the game is why it's fun. Okay? What's more, the most successful adaptive systems, animals in the world, are the ones that play. Here's an example of dolphins playing. <coughs> We've lost our sound. So they're exhibiting something fundamental about play. So those of you, those of us who study actual play, we're not just talking about running around on a playground. Play is actually a way of being. It's not necessarily an activity, it's a way of being. Right? And the dolphins here are exhibiting a fundamental aspects of play, which is play celebrates uncertainty. Okay? It encourages diversity. Play becomes more complex, more interesting when it's diverse. It's open to possibility. In fact, play creates possibility. It's cooperative. And as the dolphins were showing you there, it's intrinsically motivated. There was no reason for blowing those bubbles. Play is its own reward. It's one of our only behaviors where the behavior itself is the reward to the behavior. We play in order to play. OK? That's what play is. All those ways of being, I would suggest, are also fundamental to learning. This is the way of being that we need to encourage with learning. And in my case, I talk about in the case of science education and learning. So I'm going to give you a quick example about, we have five minutes, six minutes, OK? So I'm going to give an example of how I've applied these ideas to ground this in an example, right? And again, it's about science education in this case. And I'm not a huge fan of the idea that if we want to get people and kids involved in science, we have to make it fun. I don't think that's what's really important. What we have to do is make it relevant and make them part of it. Okay? In doing so, we can, it can be playful, right? So the aims here, and I should mention that for me, science is play. There's no difference. Science is not a method. It's not a process. It's a way of being, which is encapsulated by that definition of play. And my aims is I wanted these children to see science differently, but more importantly, I wanted them to see themselves differently. So it's called the iScientist program. It has these four th five things, wonder, why, what if, wow, and who cares. Okay? And we take people through that sequence. So it's called, this particular project is called the Black Alton Bees, where I took bee, a bee arena down to a school in Devon, and the kids actually created experiments. Okay, and I'm going to walk you through that story very quickly. And it's eight to 10-year-old children, 25 of them. And if you're going to ask a question of a bee, this is the wonder bit, you have to put yourself in the perspective of a bee. What does a bee care about? This is using science to teach empathy you have to put yourself in the perspective of something else, OK? Then we ask the question, why, OK? Now, I should say that when we, got, we tried to get funding for this, we were rejected. The scientists said kids couldn't make an original contribution to science. The teacher said, you can't enter a class and not know what's going to happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. These are some of the questions. I wrote them small, so you don't actually try to read them. Point is that five of the questions that these kids came up with were uh, the basis of papers in scientific journals published in the last 10 years. So they were asking original questions. The next step is, wow, right? And that the kids designed a game, and here they are making their observations. What they're doing is recording where the bees are actually flying. So they're getting data. And then they're analyzing that data, making their figures in crayon, because we're going to try to get this published. 
Okay? So, of course, here's their observations. They set the puzzle to bees. Can they go to blue flowers when surrounded by yellow, or yellow flowers when surrounded by blue? Won't go into the details. That's the data. So we're going to write a paper. So, of course, we have to go to a pub if we're going to write a paper. <laughs> right? That's the good part about not being the teacher. You can do things you're not supposed to do. <coughs> that one's mine. Okay. <laughs> I had the laptop. I gave them the questions. They gave me the words. This is a paper written by eight to ten-year-old children. We're going to try to get it published. Original observations, I should add. Right? No one had made these observations before. Right? So we try to submit the paper. We go to various journals, and it's rejected. Maybe because the paper starts once upon a time. <laughs> right? In the results, then we put the bees into the fridge, and they bee pie, smiley face. It literally says that. Right? In the results, training phase two, the puzzle, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> In the discussion session, they suggested teaching the bees how to play Sudoku. <laughs> right? So it was rejected. But it's an original contribution to science, written by children. Okay? So is there a right way to write a science paper? <laughs> Apparently. Right? So make a long story short, Six months project took two years to get it published. I got two experts to write a commentary for why this was important in the world of science, submit it to a journal, which is Royal Transactions here, International Journal, interviewed by five independent referees, because it's not a pet project, we want it properly reviewed, and it was published. Okay? And I wrote the abstract to situate it, and the kids see, once upon a time, introduction. <laughs> These are now the youngest published scientists in the world, eight to ten years old. Right? <laughs> now, not to glorify it, it's just to show how significant it was. Two days before Christmas, it was downloaded 30,000 times. Right? Reported in every UK and international newspaper. I don't Twitter, but apparently it's the most Twittered item for at least a second. Um, <laughs> as if that matters. Um, freely, the journal is a fee paying. This particular paper is free for everyone forever. And it was downloaded not just by scientists, but by many, many different types of people, okay? This then resulted, oh, I'm wearing the same jacket. This resulted. <laughs> everything else is different, okay. So, in the youngest TED speaker, who was Amy, who was one of the, uh, one of the authors, okay? So, to teach. What is it to teach? So, we'll just wrap up. You're basically shaping another person's history through teaching. Through that shaping of history, you're getting them to see differently. So I suggest really what teaching is about is not what to see, but how to look. You need to help people in how to look at the world, not what they should see when they look into the world. That's what it is to teach, in my view. And you do that through questions, not through answers. Questions that come from them, not from us. So what defines a good leader, because a teacher is a leader? What defines a good leader? Now, if I were to ask you, you'd probably come with all kinds of different words that describe a good leader. All of them are, in a sense, true. There are only three that are associated with the success of any company, which is lead by example, admit mistakes, and see quality in others. Those are the only three that are associated with leadership that define a good company, right? Lead by example is to create a space that is secure. That's trust. Play doesn't it happen unless it's in a trusting environment, a safe space. All right? Admit mistakes. That's a space that celebrates uncertainty. All right? Again, like play. See quality in others. That's a space that's open to diversity. Again, like play. Okay? So what I would say, what defines a good leader is how you lead others into uncertainty. So, with that said, I'm going to show you two examples of leadership, and you can decide which one you are.
Okay, one type of leadership, leading by example. Here's another type. <laughs> yeah. What kind of leader are you? <laughs> so, thank you very much. I'm just going to finish with one thought, which is when you're teaching, you, and how do we enable people to see differently? The first step is to put them into a space I call seeing yourself see. Right? When you look at this illusion, you're seeing your, your brain is doing an amazing thing. Your brain is entertaining two realities simultaneously that are mutually exclusive. You are seeing one reality. The two tiles are different. But now, you also know another reality. You know that they are the same. Your brain is holding those two realities at the same time. You are literally being an observer of yourself. You're literally seeing yourself see. And when you see, you're seeing the, a manifestation of your history. Okay. So when you put people into that space of seeing yourself see, you're giving them an awareness. And that's the first step to be able to see it differently. So thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Are you glad you came this morning? Yes. Yeah. I've got one question. What's this for? Well, I was going to do that if there's time. Well, so, there's got to be time, okay, because we're all well, wondering what I need a volunteer. Part. Okay, well, that's, that, that's my <laughs> mistake, isn't it? All right, so what this we have, is scripted, this is an way. example of seeing yourself see, and I just love to do it. Okay, so <laughs> I... We don't, I, we don't have to video this, by the way. Oh, no, no, this is, this is the bit that's going live. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to put this, this helmet on. Let's, oh, mm -hmm. let's see. It's been around the world a bit. Do I look like the guys off Daft Punk yet? Okay. <laughs> okay, so now... There we go. Okay, we need you to stand in the middle so everyone can see. Now, 16 years of building a credible persona shot. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> it's good. He, he's seen this before and he still thinks it's funny. Okay, look that way. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to clap and I want you okay. to point in the direction of my clapping. Okay. Okay, well, close your eyes. Okay. okay. Easy. Brilliant. Okay, now we're going to do something a little different. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, now again, I'm going to clap, mm -hmm. and I want you to point in the direction of my clapping. <laughs> I know I'm pointing the wrong way, but that's where it's coming from. That's all behind me. Behind me? Okay, now open your eyes this time and point in the direction of my clapping. Well, obviously, it's over there. Yeah. Okay, what's the point of that? That is a literal example of seeing yourself see. Yeah. By being an observer of yourself, you literally change the way you heard, in this case, the direction of, of the, the location of, of sound. Fantastic. Right? So that's what this is for. And I'd like to say that it's worthwhile to make that point, making myself subject to the complete humiliation of all the people <laughs> here today, and everybody watching on video later on, guys. That was for you. <laughs> but one quick question before we get on to questions from the audience. If we are in the business of helping people learn, getting to learn well, and building performance in organizations, this business of seeing people see is that fundamental to what we're doing? Should we be, as well as everything else we do, because we can't throw it away, helping people understand how we learn? Yeah. And if so, how, it's a quite a big question, how do we do it? Are there, any, are there a few fundamental things that we can help people with to help them very quickly understand how they learn, which will help them learn better? Yeah, so, yes. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to yes. start the next hour. Now. Uh, so, hopefully, the last 45 minutes was about yeah. what we should be raising people's awareness about. 
So raising people's awareness that their perceptions of the world, how they learn, how they see the world, how they see themselves is grounded in their history. Those history create assumptions, right? So the first step in any process of learning is, depending on what it is, of course, you're trying to teach, is trying to reveal what those assumptions are, right? One. Two, to create a space in which it's okay mm. to reveal those assumptions, and even more fundamentally, to question them. Wow. That's the role of play. If you can't do that, then no one is going to either discover their assumptions, much less question them. Right? Now, typically in business organizations, and in fact in schools as well, because to me they're fundamentally linked. We can't change schools unless we change business. We can't change business unless we change schools because schools educate in the way that businesses want. Businesses work the way they do because the way schools educate kids. Right? All of them are focused on answers. They're all focused on efficiency. Right? Efficiency is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with efficiency. If a bus is coming at you, you want to step out of the way. You don't want to think, is there a better way I can see this? <laughs> Right? I wonder if I imagined a hip, you know. So, no, you want to be efficient and step out of the way quickly. A fundamental way to encourage efficiency is competition. That's how it does it, that's how we do it in nature, right? Natural selection, competition, you become very efficient, right? Very focused. You're not open to diversity. You're not open to possibility. But efficiency is only one side of innovation. The other side of innovation is creativity. Creativity by itself is also pointless, right? You can have a wonderfully creative idea about something that simply couldn't be applied. So innovation requires the marriage of those two. The problem is we emphasize efficiency at the expense of creativity. I think what we need to do is to encourage, not to replace efficiency, but encourage creativity. So Jobs once said, innovation is a creative idea that ships. And it's about creating that space where both can coexist. And what's really clever is knowing when you should do one versus the other, because we walk through our lives thinking that everything is a bus. Wow, that's a great answer. Right, uh, any more questions for Bo from the floor? Get, put your hand up and get the microphone to you. Hi. Um, I think, in a way, we kind of ruin our ability for leadership, because, I, at least in the States, we don't play to play. We play to win. Yeah. And it's really how do you define winning? And that, I think that really messes it up for us all. And unfortunately, we're taught that at an incredibly young age, that the play to play. Everyone says, oh, it's important that they have fun, but make sure you win, because winning is <laughs> fun. Yeah. So I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree? Oh, completely agree. Because um, that isn't actually play. That's a game, but it's not play. So play has a very specific definition that, in some sense, it's pointless. Of course, it's not pointless because it, if it's, it, it evolved to be there. But what it's trying to deal with is uncertainty. So because I have a uh, business in Silicon Valley, I know a great deal about this concept of play to win. And in fact, I find Silicon Valley a very uncreative place. Yeah. Everyone is trying to make Facebook spelt with a PH, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe if we took that exact same thing and made it slightly different shade of blue and called it something else, we'd be successful. Why? Because they're pattern matching. Say, so this was successful, let's just alter it a little bit, and now we're just going, I don't need to go into even more examples. The point is, Silicon Valley, ironically, is not very creative. When, in my experience, because they play to win, which really narrows possibility, right? When I gave, I gave a talk to the G8 last year, and it was all about innovation. So they flew in all these people from Silicon Valley, right? And it was all the importance of technology and, and all this, and Branson was giving, talking about technology, and so I stood up and I said, you know what, technology has nothing to do with innovation. The next greatest innovation is not going to be a technology, it's going to be a way of being. That's our next greatest innovation, a way of looking at the world, not a way of interacting with it. So, and I think that's what comes from playing to play. But another really important point is that we think that creativity is this messy, messy process. It's not. Creativity is only created from the outside, not from the inside. The person who's making that what seems to be a big jump, for them, it's a small jump. It makes sense. For them, those two things are actually next to each other. From the outside, they're very far apart. So we think, ah, how creative. Actually, it was very logical if you're on the inside. So there's nothing really creative about creativity. 
Great. We've got one just here, and then we'll come over to the middle. Yes, go ahead. The microphone doesn't seem to be working. Just talk really loudly. You've, um, you, you've, you've shocked and you've surprised and you've disturbed me a little, which is good. I'm sure that's what you intended to do. Do you know less now? Yeah, yeah. I really? Uh, and, and See, thing, I succeeded. Yeah, one thing in particular I know less about is a semantic thing. Because I, I was particularly disturbed when I saw you, you put in a slide and you spoke about information is meaningless. And then you spoke about how it becomes meaningful when the brain makes patterns of it that relates it to your past experience and the things you know and so on. And I'd always felt that it was data that was meaningless and that that patterning turned it into information. Is this a, a, a then a meaningless thought process? Is, it, is the semantic aspect of it irrelevant now? Possibly. I mean, we're all delusional, so you can just choose your delusions. <laughs> um, the... I use information in a very strict sense, in a mathematical sense, information theory. So information, <coughs> i.e., the stuff that in that case it's falling onto your eyes is like data. It's the stuff that the brain is using to make sense. So, uh, so that's how I'm using information in a very strict sense. So I use them interchangeably. You, I can see how, in some cases, we could talk about information. What we're actually layering on there is the meaning of the information, not the information itself. And it's really important to make the distinction between the two. I think we have one more just to hear. Uh, I mean, wait, wait one second. How, if at all, do you uh, apply what you just talked about in your businesses? Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, um, one of them that there. Are, well, there are a couple. One of them is called Beautiful Mind, and it's a collaboration between my lab and it's the sixth top design house in the world, which is based in the UK. It's a branding consultant called Purpose Limited. And so we created Beautiful Mind, and the idea is to use actually an understanding of what it is to be human in branding. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to say something. And people in branding are wonderful at their ability to say stuff, right, and to engage with people. So for me, we're, we're basically our aim, not because we have beautiful minds, we're trying to create beautiful minds. And I'm using branding as a vehicle to do that. So we create objects, we create uh, experiences with companies, with individuals, to get them to see differently. So that's what Beautiful Mind is doing. The, the other one is called Traces, it's a social network platform, and we're arguing it's the tr first truly social network platform because it's actually grounded in what we know the brain needs to be social, oh. okay? Facebook is not social, it's broadcasting, right. right? So our aim is actually to, incur to use digital technology to foster human relationship, not to separate it. And, that's, and so we use, again, our principles of understanding human behavior and perception to do that. It's not launched yet. Right? Wow. I think that may be a topic for next year, I don't know. It's an awful lot, and it's absolutely key to what, of course, we're doing. The idea of actually having a social network platform where people can talk to each other, learn from each other, and it works as the brain works, wouldn't that be great? I tell you what, I know you challenged us to know less at the end. Perhaps I do know less now than at the beginning, but certainly my imagination's been fired, and I've got all these thoughts buzzing around my head. I want to go out, have the conversations, and learn more, so I guess you've also succeeded in that way. But thank you very much thank for you a great talk. Thank you. That was absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.